Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore. Our goal is to bring evidence and experience to illuminate critical public health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to dentists Sujay Mehta and Leah Leinbach about how oral health extends far beyond cleanings and cavities and is a serious public health concern that doesn't get enough attention. Let's listen. Sujay Mehta and Leah Leinbach, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about oral health. You're both dentists. And I want to talk sort of beyond your regular oral health, like getting your cavities filled. What's always struck me about dental health is that it's an employee perk, right? And Medicaid and Medicare don't actually cover it. So I'm wondering what results from that arrangement. Leah? Thank you for that question. Again, my name is Leah Leibach. Uh, I am an oral health provider and public health professional at the current moment. And that's a question that comes up often. My background is in hospital-based oral health care, both in education and actual direct patient care. And one of the things that I think people less than do not know is that there's a lot more to oral health than drill and fill and teeth cleanings every six months and things of that nature. And that's less than what is reflected in the coverage scheme or the dental benefit scheme that's currently present in the United States. And that's great for a certain population of people. But it's not so great for certain other populations of people. And I think that's something that is absolutely worth discussing and definitely bringing into the public health space more than it is right now. And so what do I mean by that? Again, working in a hospital space for eight or so years, I've seen people who come in for what we call optimization for certain other procedures, things like cardiac valve replacements, hematopoietic stem cell transplants, things of that nature, that oral health and so-called good oral health, is absolutely necessary for maintaining the health of that person, both from an oncologic perspective and also from an oral health perspective, just from an overall perspective. And the way that a lot of oral health is delivered in this country does not necessarily allow for, in my personal opinion, the best possible care for those populations. You're talking about the poor and the elderly. Absolutely, the poor and older Americans, but also this group of patients for whom oral health is influencing a disease course or is complicating something else other than what's in the oral cavity or oral region. It's something where if there is a perspective of dentistry as being only related to these six-month recalls or fillings or a lot of the things that we're used to from having an experience where we don't have a large amount of oral health problems. There is still a group of people that do need a certain type of specific care that are less and left out of the care scheme. So you're saying that your oral health can affect your cardiac health, say? Yeah, absolutely. And so the American Heart Association recommends that prior to certain cardiac procedures, anything that's sort of a prosthetic, anything that would allow the blood in a way to be passing through something else that's not necessarily part of the original body, are recommended to have dental issues or oral health problems addressed prior to that certain procedure. If you have a baseline of oral health problems, or you have active oral health problems, or even some chronic oral health problems that may not be addressed adequately by the current system, and obviously there's an individual role to all of this as well, then from my perspective, seeing patients come in with a whole bunch of problems, and then they need a valve replacement next week, it definitely does not allow for efficient, in a lot of ways, the best possible care for that patient. Even if those issues are addressed, prior to any of these procedures, moving forward, that patient also would benefit from longitudinal, long-term specified care, keeping in mind the other health problems of that person. 
in order to maintain both the quality and the, the longevity of that actual prosthetic device or whatever the intervention was, and also obviously the patient. So those are the, some of the things that I think may not always be upfront or top of mind to the public health community and to some of the people that are making some of the decisions. So Sujay, sort of how did we get here? You know, well, how did we get to a place where oral health is not considered medical health? Yeah, that's an interesting, you know, historical dilemma. It actually has some roots with Baltimore. There was a gentleman back in the 1820s, I think his name was Hayden, who was recommending to the local Baltimore medical school at the time techniques of how to address facial infections, including tooth extraction. So he's recommending to the medical students how to go about addressing some of these things. And it's in dentistry, it's called the great rebuff where, you know, the, the medical school said, no, thanks. You know, I, we're not really interested. And I think back at that time, it was something you went to, you know, the barber surgeon would address this. This might be done in, you know, kind of a circus carnival atmosphere. There might be musicians there to drown out the screams because this is before local anesthetic. And it really wasn't considered something that the medical school wanted to get involved with. And so in 1840, this gentleman started the first dental school in Baltimore. But over the years, even though, you know, there's been other individuals, dentists who demonstrated the benefits of ether and nitrous oxide, gradually we get this ongoing separation, uh, even insurance. Medical insurance is considered a necessity it's to address you know, these exorbitant costs for catastrophic illness. But on the other hand, dental insurance is considered more of a benefit. You know, it, it's focused on preventive care. And a lot of my patients, they're very much concerned about the catastrophic costs associated with reconstruction after assault, after motor vehicle collisions, after various kinds of medical impairments that impact the oral cavity. So this greater conversation of including oral health with you know universal health care, we've got these recommendations from various organizations over the past 20 years, growing calls for this. And in some situations, when there's this overlap of perhaps medically necessary oral care, this might be something definitely of value. So you mentioned the resolutions. Leah, I saw that WHO passed a landmark resolution last year to create a strategy and action plan for oral health. What's the significance of that? I think there is definitely a commitment from an organization of that caliber to elevate oral health, both at the national level and globally. And that is incredibly important. I think it's due to the work of a lot of people over a long period of time. And there's been pushes of that nature in the past as well. But at this point in time, with all the things that we're experiencing in the world and understanding our own interconnectivity, I think elevating oral health at this moment, including fluoride into the list of essential medicines, allowing people to have greater access to those sorts of preventative medications is huge. And it allows for a discussion at the level of the World Health Organization with all of these people at the table, including oral health providers, to say, how can we actually do the best good with the resources that we have available in a high value way? Sujay, this just sort of really makes me think about the disparities we must really be seeing here with who's getting oral health and who's not. Yeah, so this is a major problem because approximately 94% of dental delivery is through a private practice system. You have to pay to play, so to speak. So if you've got the funds and if you've got insurance coverage, it's fine. But what about, you know, from a public health perspective, when you're trying to incorporate care for all, we have numerous segments of the population that just can't access care. A lot of these individuals will go to their family physician for essentially a toothache or something else. It might not even be a toothache. It could be oral mucositis, so an inflammation in the mouth lining. That encompasses a whole number of disease processes in, in the mouth. And the family physician will say, well, it looks like a dental problem. Go see your dentist. And then 
you know, if you can't afford, where would you go? You might get referred to ear, nose, and throat, and certainly could get some appropriate care for certain things, but not others. And then again, with other segments of the population, what are we going to do for incoming refugees? What are we going to do for the incarcerated population? What are we going to do? I mean, there's any number of socioeconomic groups or folks just who don't have access to funds or the care that truly need it. And it it reinforces that concept of that inverse care law that we've got people who can afford it, but they might not have major dental problems or oral health problems, but the folks that really need it, we're not able to access the care that they need. What is the way forward here? <laughs> That's a big one. I I think the first step is actually having a discussion about it. You mentioned previously the World Health Organization. There are recommendations from the Institute of Medicine, the NIDCR's report, most recent report, Oral Health in America. There are discussions at high level about the relationship between oral health and general health, especially. And that is amazing. I think as a former residency director myself, I think we have to think about education and policy making decisions, as well as the research and how we can actually really invest into well-considered research that informs the next steps. And that's, that's one of the big gaps that I see personally, the data sets and just sort of questions being asked to actually generate the information and the knowledge that we need to make well-informed decisions that are both good for patients and cost-effective. And so I think collaboration, I know that's that's a word that often gets thrown around a lot, but I really do think that even having a threat of including oral health in certain research projects were even just discussing how oral health might play a role in patient care and some of the research that's even being done at Hopkins, for example, is a step in the absolute right direction. And then ideally, when those discussions are had at some of these higher levels, the information is available to actually inform those choices that we make. We need to recognize that the oral cavity, we can't just have it divorced from the rest of the body and siloed off into our own little sphere. We've been, you know, practicing in our own little head down sort of fashion. But there's definitely some interplaying relationships here. Improving education is a huge component, not only on the oral health side, but on allied health, medical side, and some more collaborative interprofessional education. We clearly have barriers to access care, but we have barriers to educating oral health professionals. And we need to have better funding to create a more diverse student population and even amongst our dental faculty. And then that plays on to research. And then that plays into policy. We need to really work on improving and getting our policymakers aware that it's not just early childhood tooth decay and periodontal disease. There's so many other aspects to oral health that we need to consider. Sujay Mehta, Leah Leinbach, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Holes-Fernandez and Amber Bryan-Singletary. Thank you for listening.